Ah, the infographics show. How wonderful to see them back here again. You know, last time I responded to a video from them, I was worried that I came off as needlessly harsh, that I shouldn't be so hard on an educational program like them. I mean, sure, there was historical inaccuracy and some misinformation, but it was ultimately harmless. Just a simple discussion on Vikings versus Samurai. It was fundamentally simple and meaningless. But not this time. This time is different. This time the video I'll be looking at is called Medieval Knights Were Not Noble, But Cold-Hearted Killers. Now, let's make one thing perfectly clear before we go any further. Knights killed people. No one is going to deny that in this video or any other. Knights were soldiers, warriors, and that usually means they specialize in killing people. My issue with this title is not the fact that knights are killers, but that they are cold-hearted, cold-blooded. That's the part that I take issue with. As if implying they lacked any sort of empathy, humanity, or care. They just liked killing. It was their thing. This is going in line with a very common outlook in today's culture that knights are evil warmongers. <laughs> For honor joke there. Who kill anyone they disagree with religiously or politically or racially. And th that's just a vast overgeneralization and brazenly inappropriate. As a historian and a lover of medieval history... I simply can't ignore this. So let's go. Time to respond to a video. As usual, I don't take it I don't want any harassment done to anybody. I mean no disrespect for the infographic show, but like I said, can't ignore this one. So let's do it. When we think about knights, we usually have noble men in mind, heroic warriors whose gallantry was unsurpassed. We've all heard the tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which include the dauntless and dashing Sir Lancelot and his spirited son Sir Galahad. But Arthurian legend is just that, legend, and knights in real life bore no resemblance to these romantic depictions. We might look at the oath the Knights of the Round Table took, which was all about chivalry, not being greedy, not taking land by power, not being cruel or murderous, to always be merciful and, of course, always do your best to protect women, sometimes referred to as damsels. It all sounds good on paper, but it hardly mirrored reality. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, how medieval knights were not noble but cold-hearted killers. First of all, what is a knight? A knight was basically someone who was a skilled warrior and someone who was also highly skilled at fighting on horseback. The old English word for knight actually means something like servant or boy and knights throughout the Middle Ages might have been in the services of the country, a rich noble person, or the church. The Crusades, for instance, they were basically military men, but over time developed codes of conduct, or what we call chivalry. For their service, they received land. All they had to do was pledge an allegiance to the king or an overlord. An overlord might have a number of knights in his service. The more the merrier if you wanted to take someone else's land. Okay, not bad. So far, so good. But I do want to clarify that they weren't just warriors or skilled fighters. Knights were shock troopers of the medieval world. They were the elite, the best, the ones we send to break a line of enemy soldiers. You armed them with the best you had to offer, and they got things done no one else could. Not all medieval European warriors were knights. But again, I mean, so far, so good. Nothing truly heinous right now. These knights, though, were not born to the peasant class. They were of noble birth and would, as kids or pages, learn from older knights how to fight and hunt. When they reached the age of 15, they became squires, and after that, if things went well, they could receive a knighthood. That usually happened as it does in the movies, with a sword being tapped on the shoulders and the new knight swearing his allegiance. Things like jousting tournaments actually took place, as did roundtable meetings. They also had a code of conduct, and they were supposed to embrace charity, faith, strength, loyalty, moderation, and justice. So far, this all sounds rather like the Knights of the Round Table, but this is the Middle Ages we're talking about, a time when life was brutal for most people. Say that again, and really think about the relevance of that comparison. You're comparing the Arthurian world, a world of fairies, dragons, nymphs, and magic, to the Middle Ages. Yes, the Middle Ages were pretty harsh and difficult to live through, even in times of peace. The Middle Ages had their fair share of hardships. Hard times can breed difficulty and strife for everyone. But do you really want to compare it to a fairy tale land of Camelot, where many outrageous magical problems are solved by magical solutions? In very few of the Arthurian legends do we read, do we see that they deal with the same kind of issues as the Middle Ages did. 
in Arthurian legend, you deal with threats like dragons and wizards more commonly than you do pestilence and barbarian raiders. See why this is a really inappropriate standard we're setting? But this is only a minor issue, guys. The comparison of the Arthurian standard to modern knights is only a minor issue. It's, we're about to get even further in. Let, let's keep going. One example of brutality is that these knights were often given the right to pillage. Yep, they were allowed to ride into some small village and take what they wanted. This was not good for their peasants or craftsmen that lived in those villages, as they could not defend themselves. As Steven Pinker points out in his book on the history of violence, the better angels of our nature, the knights would often be busy ransacking villages and any resistance was met with obscene violence. This was not about being noble, but taking what you wanted because you could. They saw themselves as superior to the peasant class. It was their right to take what they wanted. As Pinker says though, this proved to be very problematic. The reason was because the commoners that worked on the land, called serfs, were owned by the landholder. That meant that when they were killed or hurt or stolen from, the landholder lost out too. In turn, that landholder would plan an attack on someone else's serfs. The only real losers, of course, were the poor. Uh, where do I start? Where do I begin? Let's start with this. I've got an let's start with, let's start with this. Knights were given the right to pillage. No, they weren't. Knights had no such right. In wartime, pillaging is a natural part of war for any nation or army, not just for knights. But the the thing is you're not talking about war. You're saying that a knight could literally get up one day, throw on his armor, waltz to his neighbor's land and say, "I'm stealing your stuff and if you get in my way, I'll kill you. In fact, I'll just kill you anyway because I can do that. I'm a knight. It's my right." Have you stopped to consider the consequences of such an action? Leaving out the fact that he'd lose a lot of his reputation and be seen as a dangerous individual and a questionable asset to his own lord or king for whom he serves, it's going to spark a potential war with the neighboring lord he just attacked. That knight could be executed for doing something like that, or excommunicated, maybe even both. A knight who goes off the reservation for no reason other than he just wants to, or just wants to is a threat to stability and peace. He is not an asset. But wait, I hear you cry. What about that guy they referenced, Steven Pinker? Didn't he write a whole book on the history of violence? They have a source that clearly states knights were savage and cruel to peasants and had the right to harm others, right? Well, firstly, Steven Pinker is not a historian. Based on the research I've found, his fields of research are in psychology, cognitive science, and linguistics, not history. The book he wrote has been critically panned by several historians from appraised universities. In 2018, the academic journal Historical Reflections published the first issue of their 44th volume entirely devoted to responding to this book, in light of its significant influence on the wider culture, such as appraisal from Bill Gates. In this issue, Mark S. McCall, professor of history at the University of Illinois, and Philip Dwyer, professor of history at Newcastle University, write in the introductory paper that, quote, not all the scholars included in this journal agree on everything, but the overall verdict from us is that Pinker's thesis, for all the stimulus it may have given to discussions around violence, is seriously, if not fatally, flawed. The problems that come up time and time again are the failure to genuinely engage with historical methodologies, the unquestioning use of dubious sources, the tendency to exaggerate the violence of the past in order to contrast it with the supposed peacefulness of the modern era, the creation of a number of straw men, which Pinker then goes on to debunk, and its extraordinarily Western-centric, not to say Whiggish, view of the world. End quote. That was a quote from two professors of history from two acclaimed universities. And there were a total of 12 historians that responded to this, that read over his book and reviewed it. As a matter of fact, I highly encourage you read the article in that journal specifically dedicated to this topic about medieval knights and medieval times um, written by Sarah M. Butler called Getting Medieval on Steven Pinker um, about violence in medieval England. It's $22 to read, and it's actually very, very interesting. The abstract reads, Steven Pinker's view of the Middle Ages as an air of hyperviolence is in which governments engaged in demicide and civil civilians lived in constant terror is not supported by the evidence. I want you to remember that civilians living in constant terror is not supported by the evidence that governments engaged in constant demicide is not supported by the evidence by analyzing Pinker sources for the medieval period and providing a clear understanding of the difficulties involved in extracting statistical data from medieval England's criminal justice system. This article hopes to demonstrate that Pinker's thesis about the civilizing process is not 
tenable. While the medieval world was violent, we cannot definitively say just how violent it actually was and whether it was any more or less violent than we than we see today. Keep that in mind. This is from an actual historian and from an actual historical journal. Frankly, Steven Pinker's book, the source that they choose, is one, not based on or written by a historian, and two, is widely criticized by other historians. It's not a trustworthy historical source. I wouldn't trust this dude's credentials to explain to me how the Knights acted. He doesn't have any credible uh, frame of reference, and other historians are saying that his sources and references are dubious and questionable. But, for the sake of argument, let's assume for one minute we should take him seriously. His argument that Knights had the right to take what they wanted is a fabricated piece of nonsense. They had no such right, and should Knights engage in that kind of activity, there would of course be dire consequences, such as execution or excommunication or both. We follow it up with another piece of nonsense that, with the serfs hurt or dead, the local lord who lost those serfs would then go on to do the same thing to someone else. That's ludicrous. If someone breaks into your house and kills your wife, do you then say to yourself, dang, well, I better go across the street and kill Mark's wife too. <laughs> I might as well keep the chain going. No, you find the guy who did it and you pay him back. Or you call the cops on the guy who did it. Or you seek justice against the guy who did it. You wouldn't randomly go out and kill other people's serfs. Okay? You, that's not what you do. You wouldn't go out and do it to someone else to spread the evil. You would try to seek justice. And it is for that reason that knights wouldn't randomly go out and kill other people's serfs for the sake of killing other people's serfs. You can't just get away with that without some kind of repercussion or, or recourse. It flies in the face of logic. In an interview with Scientific American, Pinker says, Statistics aside, accounts of daily life in medieval and early modern Europe reveal a society soaked in blood and gore. Medieval knights, whom today we would call warlords, fought their numerous private wars with this single strategy, kill as many of the opposing knights' peasants as possible. False. So much false right now. The false. The false is strong with this one. That wasn't the strategy of any knight. Again, Knights were shock troopers. They fought at the command of their lord. Do you know what it would mean if a local lord couldn't control his own knight? Here's the thing. You're talking about knights in their private wars. Knights didn't really have their own private wars. Remember, they served the, the noble, the feudal lord. They served their lord or landowner. They served a king. They didn't go out and decide to make war themselves. They serve someone else. If they're going out and fighting their own battles and starting their own wars without the consent of their lord, without the consent of the person who, you know, as you call it, hired them, do you know what that means? Do you know what that's going to look like? It's going to be a disaster. Knights didn't want to kill enemy peasants because if the goal was to capture the enemy's land, they would need the serfs alive to keep working it. The only reason knights would be called to kill peasants was if they were there to put down a peasant revolt or if the enemy army was so desperate they were hiring peasants to fight for them. They didn't just run over and kill peasants. That wasn't a good idea for the, for the reasons I just mentioned. What was a knight's tactic then? A knight's tactic was to ride in a cavalry formation and charge the lines of enemy soldiers as a shock unit and break the line. On horse or on foot, the job of a knight was to engage the toughest enemies and help create openings in the enemy line for the common foot soldier. It wasn't about fighting private wars. Some feudal lords did fight over land with other feudal lords, that's true, and they might have sent knights to help fight those wars. But neither side wanted to kill all the peasants on the other side, because odds are good they will need that peasant class later to work the land that they just took. And also keep in mind, a knight is not the same as a feudal lord. A knight might be given a village or a small plot of land to live off of. He doesn't have the resources to wage a war on a neighboring land himself. He doesn't have his own private army to go and wage war. The noble lord has the army. The knight is just a part of that army that it was given land at the behest of the feudal lord. Being a knight wasn't always about protecting the land and being a noble warrior, but being a strong force that was high enough in the hierarchy that you could get away with murder. As one person put it, medieval knights indulged in relentless, brutal acts of savagery. Yes, that one anonymous person that you won't name. With that kind of testimony, how could I ever go on with this response video? Word of the wise, when you're writing a bibliography, don't cite your sources one person. It doesn't add any credibility. We need names. We need a person so that we know that the person you're referencing is a credible resource. Just calling him one person, I have no reason to trust him. 
But aside from that, you know knights were Catholic, right? Murder was kind of a bad thing to many of them, right? I'm not saying that all knights were pure and morally upright, but what knight swears his loyalty to the church and to God just so he can get away with murdering people? Is that why people join the Navy SEALs? So they can legally kill? You'd said yourself that most knights were born into it. Most didn't say, I want to grow up and be a mass murderer. They grew up being taught the code of a knight and would aspire to live to it. Did all of them live up to it? No, of course they didn't. And they're always going to be awful or wicked people, knight or not. But to generalize all knights this way is inappropriate at best. You can see this in picture form in a book called The Medieval Housebook, which is a series of illustrations from the 15th century. As one encyclopedia tells us, the Middle Ages were tough times. It says in competition for sometimes scarce economic resources, land, crops, livestock, and peasants, neighboring estates frequently resorted to the sword. So yes, you needed a good stock of knights, aka hired killers. I, I do love how you keep calling them hired killers. Would you do the same for Navy SEALs or the Green Berets? Would you call them hired killers? After all, they're killers paid for by the United States. Hired killers, right? Oh wait, there's a distinction between a soldier and a murderer? That might be relevant to keep in mind. But let's put that point aside for a minute and acknowledge what you just said. Yes! Yes, you said it. You just pointed out the motivation. The Middle Ages were a difficult and very hard time for everyone, and conflict was often essential for resources. That encyclopedia did not say, because knights were just evil and cold-blooded, they often stole and killed from people just for the fun of it. They said, because resources were scarce, wars broke out, and knights were often needed for those wars. And that's the case for every country ever. Where there is hardship, there will be conflict, and where there is conflict, there will be warriors meant to fight in those conflicts. It's not about being cold-blooded or cold-hearted. It's about the necessity of warriors in wartime. We often see knights as leading the charge in battles, mostly overseas affairs at the orders of the king. Except, according to some sources, in the late Middle Ages, about 80% of knights didn't even bother fighting. They let regular soldiers go to war instead. Yes, those pesky some sources written by some people at some point in time for some reason found somewhere. Please cite your source. I want to know where you got that statistic. Also, you said the late Middle Ages. That doesn't include the early Middle Ages or the high Middle Ages, where knights were more common and necessary. In the late Middle Ages, knights were beginning to be phased out of combat due to the, due to the advent of gunpowder and firearms, so maybe it's not that they just sent regular soldiers to fight for them. Maybe it's because knights weren't as common anymore. You didn't see as many knights at that time. All they had to do to get out of military service was pay what was called a skewage. This was also sometimes called shield money. And if the king could collect enough cash from the knights, feudal troops could be bought and sent to war. These knights were not conscientious objectors. Rather, they just didn't want to fight. The great knights got out of military service and were replaced by poor folk. Which narrative are you trying to sell me, dude? Are knights cold-blooded killers or lazy assholes who'd rather not go to war in the first place? See, that's the thing. That was your that was the whole point behind this video in the first place, that they're just cold-hearted killers. They just want to kill people. Are they no longer cold-hearted killers, but they're just lazy individuals? I feel like you're... I don't understand. I feel like you're trying to just badmouth the knights and are looking for anything you can say to make that the case. The king did not have to accept the skewage, first of all, if he didn't want to. And if the knight wanted to keep his land and status, he'd better be ready to fight in the king's wars when he's called. That's the deal. And again, which time period are you talking about with the 80% of knights that didn't bother fighting? I, I don't know of any massive strike from the med medieval knights. Where is that in the history books? You want to know what phased out the knights? Like I said, firearms and the fact that currency was being developed. Yes, there was no longer a need to pay knights in land when you could pay soldiers and professional mercenaries like the Lands Connect with money. As the currency was developing, there was no longer a need for knights. Still, at times, the king did tell landowners that it was time to buckle up, get some armor on, find a good war horse, and go to battle. Some knights that did go to war in other countries wanted very much to be properly compensated, especially when they had been forced to go. Despite chivalry codes, it's well known that after battles they would plunder entire towns of everything worth anything. This was their bounty, and rightfully theirs after victory. We are also told that as well as taking the bounty, the knights would often slaughter the peasants of the defeated town. That was seen as fair game. After all, the losers were heretics. 
Let's leave out for a moment that quite often it wasn't the knights, but the foot soldiers and hired soldiers who did the pillaging because unlike the knights, they were being paid to fight rather than just upholding their oaths and duties to the lords. Let's instead talk about that bit where you said that the losers were heretics. They were not. You don't, that's not what a heretic is. A heretic was someone who was in defiance of the will or desires of the church. Now, in the case of the Crusades, when the Pope called for a crusade, um, maybe the enemies of the church could have been called heretics, but that's not the reason they killed people or pillaged people. That's not the reason, and we'll get into the reason in a minute, but that's not the reason. They weren't heretics. That wasn't the reason. That's not the excuse they used. There were there were reasons why they did it, but it wasn't because they were heretics. But leaving that aside, let, let's leave that aside, what you just said, that they, weren't, they were not heretics, okay? People throw around that word a lot, and I think you need to understand what it means. It means a heretic is someone who is in defiance of or moving against the will of the church and or God. They were not heretics. But leaving that aside, plundering and pillaging towns after defeating it was common practice for any army in medieval history. Middle Eastern warriors did it. Pagans did this. Native Americans did this. Africans did this. Chinese did this. And here's what I love about this. Here's what I love about this whole thing. You mentioned knights would sometimes loot or pillage towns, but you don't ever talk about why. Just because they wanted to? No. That's a tremendous waste of time, energy, and resources. It's because they're far from home and resource lines are thin. They need provisions. If they can't get it from the supply lines back home, which are getting stretched thin, then they have to take it where they can get it from the defeated. And as for killing the peasants of the territory, yes, yeah, sometimes knights did do that, as did many other armies of the past, not just knights. But just like there were knights who did this, there were some who didn't. There are records of Templar knights defending pilgrims as they crossed the Holy Land, the hospitaliers defending hospitals and schools from raiders, and crusading kings offering amnesty and sanctuary to travelers. Just like there are good knights out there and bad knights out there, there's always going to be a binary. There's always going to be knights who do right and knights who do wrong. Something you fail to consider in this video is that a lot of these atrocities, a lot of these atrocities, these atrocious acts are dependent on the individual. Some knights might very well have been the evil monsters you're describing, but others might very well have been the noble and honorable men you claim they weren't. Some critics also tell us that these knights who may have seen humanity at its worst probably suffered from what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. The knights could be extremely violent as there was no justice system at the time that properly functioned. People often took the law into their own hands when they believed their honor had been lost. Wait, no functioning justice system at the time? The Inquisition, what a show, the Inquisition, here we go, we know you're wishing that we'd go away, but the Inquisition's here and it's here to stay. Oh boy, the Inquisition, watch out, the Inquisition, oi, oi. That's a pretty functional justice system. Some might say too functional. A little too functional at times. For a knight that had experienced carnage, it's perhaps not surprising that some were capable of inflicting their own kind of extreme violence. One historian talking to Spiegel Online talks about the knight called Sir John Arundel. According to the historian, Sir John's gang of knights entered a convent to shield themselves from bad weather. They decided to violate the nuns in there and steal some riches. They then took the nuns on their ship, but decided to throw them overboard after they had made use of their bodies. This was during the age of chivalry. It's not something we see in Hollywood. Sure, if this guy was a real knight and really did these things, then certainly he is a cold-hearted son of a bitch. But he's one knight out of many. One bad apple. To judge the collective by the actions of one is wrong, and I want to make that clear. I'm not arguing that some knights weren't cold-hearted killers. But this guy's arguing that as a general rule, knights were just this way. That's also false. The book Chivalry in Medieval England points out knights were capable of terrible atrocities, but we've created the fallacy of the brave and noble knight because it suits us to think that the powerful were fair and noble. That book tells us that there were three things that knights fought for, and those were land, gold, and war booty. How about God? How about the crown? How about loyalty? If it's a fallacy to call all knights perfectly righteous, then it's equally so to call them all cold-blooded killers. You aren't aiming for historical accuracy. You're being a contrarian. Knights were capable of doing good things, and many did. 
There are some knights who did good and righteous things, just like there were knights who did not. They are people, imperfect people with power, and imperfect people with power often run the gambit from morally righteous to absolute evil. This is certainly not how we've portrayed knights throughout history. We seem to have mystified the past, which might be dangerous considering how we might have to learn from history. While knights may have had this code of conduct that's said to be good to women and don't kill the meek, much of the code was about obedience to those above you, to the king, to the religion, to the country. That's the code of soldiers today. But it doesn't mean all soldiers are immaculate regarding their ethics. I can't believe you can look at the modern soldier and say they live by the same kind of code the knights had, but aren't necessarily unethical. And then ex and then ex not extend the same olive branch to the knights. You're basically saying both knights and modern soldiers swear their allegiance to their country and their authorities, but modern soldiers are capable of being more ethical while knights weren't. That's outrageous. You are removing the humanity of the knights, and I'm struggling to understand why. If you can understand that the modern soldier who swore an oath to country and its and his people can still be morally righteous, why can't knights? How can you say this about modern soldiers, but not knights? What's the difference? Although one writer is less critical when talking about these people, writing, Although many knights failed to live up to the ideals of the chivalric code, many others did. Like the image of the cowboy in the American Old West, that of the chivalric knight, while often exaggerated, continues to provide a standard of conduct to which many aspire. Do you agree with that? That one writer you brought up in that literal few seconds left in your video just said the most reasonable thing I've heard so far. That was the most reasonable response. Many knights did not live up to the chivalric code, but many others did. And the chivalry code they created has become a standard that we use today and see today played out in day-to-day -day life and in our heroes. That one piece of the video was so much more honest, direct, and reasonable than anything else I've seen in this video. Though I do find it hilarious you're calling the cowboys of the Old West chivalric. You are aware that cowboys were literally cattle rustlers and, hurdler and herders, right? Look, guys, this video was awful. There are some videos that I watch that I can just laugh at because, you know, if, the, if a little bit of extra research had been done, it wouldn't have been so bad. That's why I could laugh at the previous infographic show video and just kind of make fun of it a little bit. But in this one, I know I got mad, but I feel like it was justified. This video is filled with misinformation that lacked both logic and fairness. It dismisses the human element of the knight, which allows for both good and evil in their actions and motives, and makes the assumption that because the knights had power and privilege, they, mu they must obviously use it to do wrong. It uses vague, unclear sources to support its case, and the only source it directly cites is from a questionable and criticized one at best. Knights were not always perfect. Some did wrong, some did evil, and there are plenty of examples of them doing wrong. But just as there are examples of them doing wrong, there are also examples of them doing right. It's called being a human being. It's called individualism. And to generalize all knights as being evil doesn't help history. It doesn't improve our understanding of history. It's contrarianism. I expected so much better from the infographic. I expected so much better from the infographic show, and I hated to see this kind of content. I know they're above this, and for the sake of education, I know they can really present far more enlightening content. Why? Because this is not educational. This actually hurts people. You're selling contrarianism as historical fact. This is what leads to people thinking knights were evil, racist bigots. This is what leads to believe that knights were all evil and not to be trusted. I mean no ill will towards the infographic show. And I don't want anyone being disrespectful towards them or myself. Let's all be respectful here as I do not want to insult the creators. But to be clear, who were the knights? Knights were the elite shock troopers of the Middle Ages. Noble, lead, noble lords hired knights by giving them land and property to live off of. In exchange, they would fight for the king or nobles at their behest to fight their wars or to fight their battles. Their tactics were not to kill peasants at their whim. 
because you want to protect the peasants so that they can work the land. Their tactic was to break enemy lines with their cavalry charges or with just sheer force. Some knights did horrible, atrocious things, killing innocent people, pillaging towns. There are some knights who did terrible things. There are also knights who did amazing things. There are knights who lived by a code of honor. There are knights who did good. And if we can see that about the modern soldier, the modern policeman, the the cowboy mythos, why can't we see that about knights too? Thank you guys for watching. I hope this has given you some stuff to think about. Take care, and I'll see you in my next video.